What's the haps? I'm Maroku and welcome, welcome, welcome to Steve Jackson's Sorcery! Parts 1 and 2! And potentially if we ever get to them, parts 3 and 4 as well. Because the whole thing's a bundle on sale on Steam for uh, Black Friday at its really, really good value proposition. I already own the whole thing and I played the whole thing on mobile and it was great then. And, and you know, I kind of want to share it with you guys. So while it's on sale, it's a very, very good time for me to think about doing so. So this is by the same guys who did 80 Days, which we played through last narrative month, last December, and it is that time of year again. So it is only fitting that we delve once more into sorcery. And uh, it's a kind of an interesting affair because you can kind of almost see their development process. Part one was done long before 80 Days. Part four was done long after four, after 80 Days. And you can kind of see their storytelling skills and abilities and intricacies unfold as the as the game progresses. And by part four, this game is just a stonkingly good bit of story that you owe it to yourself to experience. But for now, uh, we must begin as all great stories do at part one, the very beginning, among the Shamutanti Hills. We're going to be a cunning and ruthless sorceress. And I'm going to listen to the music because I always played on mobile on the bus and didn't have my music on because I didn't want to disturb people by having music on them on the bus like some sort of ass. So the music's actually going to be entirely new to me. So this will be a brand new experience. You have walked the wilds of Kakabad through Kare and the spiteful backlands all the way into Mampang. You have survived traps, thieves, serpents, and vengeful gods. And now it is here, the crown of kings. It is said the crown was never forged, only found by Chalana the Reformer, a lowly foot soldier who became emperor of the Eastern world, such is the power of the crown. The air around it crackles with influence. Just take it! Your destiny awaits! With the crown in your hands, you'll be as powerful as Chalana! The goblins are arming, the giants are waking, and the birdmen carving cruel daggers from stone. War will come, but you'll prevent it! But then the image of the crown begins to flicker, you rush forward! It's a trap! And startle yourself awake. You're alone, exhausted in the little hut on the in the outpost settlement. Your unimaginable journey is not even a single step begun. A little bit of a cliche intro, perhaps, but hey, there we go. Inkle! Those great storytellers. Some, some of my favorite game developers right now. I love these guys. Presents Steve Jackson's Sorcery, Part 1, Shamutanti Hills. I had these books as a kid. I had, like, books 1 and 2. They were horribly difficult. Um, it's, it's a, they've made some creative affordances that make the game a hell of a lot, manage, lot more manageable. Uh, for instance, down here, we've got a rewind button. You could undo any decision you don't like. I feel like because I've already played through the entire game and I know a lot of the decisions and the outcomes and sort of what to expect, I kind of feel like I want to really try and own the story this time and not rewind. Because it makes the game too easy if you rewind a lot. You can anytime, anytime you kind of... Well, I guess if I die entirely, maybe I will rewind, but through some sort of idiotic gaff. And if I lose a fight, perhaps I will rewind, or maybe I'll just rewind fights in general, but... Broadly speaking, the story is kind of like, oh, that didn't go quite as well as I intended. I'll just redo it and do a better thing. Probably going to give that a miss. We're, we're going we're gonna to deal with things. So we don't need that. Let's click our characters to continue. It is sunrise. You dress, breakfast on bread and goat's milk, and collect the pack and sword from beside your bed. You pause to test the blade against your thumb. The blacksmith has done well. The edge is keen and draws a narrow line of blood. Outside the hut, you hear the outpost settlement stirring into life. Pray for luck. Taking a moment more, you, you close your eyes and raise a prayer to your spirit guide. It's morning, it has the form of a panther. But what will it become once your journey truly begins? A great calm descends on you. Time to go. Time then to depart. You lift back the flap of the hut and step into the early morning sunshine. Go through the outpost settlement. So our god is up here, is the panther. You can... Usually, it interact with it most times in the story. Um, I guess we can't now because we're like very early on, but uh, yeah, at pretty much any opportunity in the story, if you can be, I think it's, I think it works out once per day in the story, you can call on your spirit animal to 
either heal you if you're in need of healing, I think they heal for four points of healing per time, or they can get you, they sometimes get you out of very, very deadly scrapes that would otherwise kill you, but if you've got your spirit available to you, you can just like utter a very quick prayer and maybe if you're lucky, they will bail you out. They don't always bail you out, but they might. Uh, and it changes throughout the game. I really don't think it necessarily matters to a great extent, except for maybe story reasons, what your god happens to be. You're a very fickle devotee. Um, yeah, we, we're not we're not that really loyal to the pamphlet, all things considered. And then the, this this is a world. This is an ancient world of much magic and spirits and things. There are gods. There are actual gods. We may encounter gods. And we can worship them, and they can become our gods instead of our spirit animals as well, so that's cool too. But for now, eyes follow us as we leave the hut and walk towards the great Shamutanti Wall. The frontiers people of this tiny settlement are well aware of your mission. We shall greet them. You turn to them and bow. Some smile in reply, but are too afraid to approach. Others make gestures of protection. You're going beyond the wall, so they believe you to be cursed. A man is waiting on the path to the Kantapani Gate, the final doorway between Analand and the wilds of Kakabad. You recognize the ser sergeant of the Sightmaster Warriors. He holds out his hand. He's a very strange creature, as all Sightmasters are, but uh, useful when allied. Uh, Greetings, sergeant. He touches his forehead with two fingers. You are almost ready, my lady, he says. I have for you a gift from the king. Twenty-four gold pieces. Is all we can spare this time. He holds out a pouch. He'll take it. You accept the gift graciously. Thank you. You should buy some supplies before you pass the wall, the sergeant says. And you must collect your spellbook if you wish magic to aid you. Finally, you should practice your swordplay. I will go one last round with you. And he points his staff towards the training ground. I definitely want my spellbook. Yep, 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 yep. One of the huts, set slightly back from the others, is decorated with glyphs and strange symbols. A terrible smell em emanates from the, from the doorway. This is the hut of the chief mage. He's been preparing your spellbook for days. Reading star charts to work out which spells will be available to you in the different locations in the hills and beyond. Oh my... That's... That's hard mode! I had... I, I... I... It's been a very, very long time since I played part one of this game. I didn't realize there was straight up the option to play the game without a spell book or starting money or food. I vaguely recall the start playing without starting money, but I don't remember playing without a spell book. I guess you would still have access to magic, but you would have no idea what you were doing. And I know there's mechanics in the game that allow you to destroy the spell book as well, which is a pretty pretty substantial, consequential issue. You know, if that happens, you're like, oh, now I don't know what I'm doing anymore. It's pretty bad. You need, you, need, you need to have a very, very firm handle on what all the magic in this game does before you do without the book. Uh, I actually would say I probably do have a very, very firm handle on the magic in the game, but I'm still going to go inside and get that friggin' book, because... Good lord. Uh, yeah, I understand how to use the book. You lift the flap and go inside, the mage asks you with haggard, sleepless eyes, do you understand how to use it? Yes. The mage nods. Good. He scratches absently, absently at his ear. Remember, some of your spells will cost you effort to use, but the ones that don't will not work without a focus, an item of some kind. You'll need to read the book to know how to use what. I can have a quick flick through that so you can see what sort of things we're going to have available to us. The Sorcery Spellbook and the Sorcery Spellbook Music. The six most useful spells. Zap creates lightning. Off creates a force field. Law controls non-intelligent creatures. Dumb makes things clumsy. Hot makes a fireball. And Wall makes a wall, surprisingly enough. All of those are incredibly tiring and will cost us three points of stamina to use, but they are free to cast otherwise. We should probably try not to use these where possible, because there are better options than all of these. Almost everything else is cheaper or more effective. Big does not require focus, costs one stamina, and just makes us big. That's a good one. Walk costs us gold, we will probably have gold on us most of the time. That's a shield, that costs one stamina. Uh, Dop is a one, sp one stamina free spell that unlocks anything locked, unless it has like magical protection. Raz will be tricky to come by. Beeswax is not common in the game. It is free to cast if you have beeswax and it makes your sword way better. Sus is one stamina to find out if there are any traps ahead. Very, very useful. Six, one stamina to multiply yourself by six. Also has a lot of purpose. Jig a bamboo flute. I don't know where you get a bamboo flute until like right 
towards the end of the fourth game. So I imagine there's probably a lot of places you could use it, but I never found them. Goblin's teeth we will pick up from time to time. Probably most of them in the second game, I think. They let us summon goblins to do our bidding. Yob, they, they're throughout the game, actually. You commonly get giant's teeth, allowing you to summon giants to do your bidding. They're very useful, so you should save those for things where the giant will just kill something that's really nasty for you for free. Gum requires a vial of glue and will be consumed when you use it, so all things considered, actually kind of an expensive one, because glue is not very common in the game, but it allows you to stick things permanently to things. How is when we get lost and want to find a way out? Doc uh, can be cast on a potion, not always, but sometimes it lets... we You will pick up a lot of potions as we go along, or vials of limberry juice is what it is, and we can turn that into a healing potion with Doc, but we won't always have the opportunity to do that, so I think a lot of the times it gives you, when you can cast it, and you know, sometimes sometimes you just have the opportunity to cast a spell for whatever reason, and sometimes it will be Doc, so you can turn it into a healing potion, and then keep the healing potion in your pack, so that's probably a pretty good move in that instance. Doze, doze, allows people to doze, you know, it puts things to sleep. Dud creates a bunch of fake treasure. Mag protects us against magic. I never found any good uses for that, but that's in the game. Pop makes an explosion but requires pebbles. They're surprisingly less common than you might imagine. You'd think pebbles would be everywhere, but they're not. Full is slow falling. Dim makes things pretty stupid. Uh, fog makes things dark. Mud creates sinky sand but requires some sand to do so. Nif makes things smelly but we can't do it unless we have n nose plugs. Tell is telepathy, it allows us to read minds, that requires a skull cup. Gak makes things afraid of whatever we want them to be afraid of, really, but it requires a black face mask, which are pretty rare. Sap makes them demoralized. God makes them worshippers. Kin makes a duplicate of whatever we're fighting, which allows them to fight in our stead. And for some reason, it does... Yeah, that, 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 the image that illustrates that... There's, it's kind of got an object in there that looks phallic, is what I would say. I've not noticed that one before. Not as obvious on mobile. Pep makes you gives you a bit of pep. You drink fire water and it makes you super strong. I never found any fire water whatsoever at all in the game, except for right before the final boss. I don't know where you get that. Rock turns things to stone. Nip makes you speedy. Huff creates a gale of air. Uh, fix fixes things in place. The oak stapling is stupidly hard to get. I think I found I found like one of the I found I found the stapling the stapling I found the uh, sapling but couldn't figure out how to turn it into a staff easily. So that was always my problem. Uh, nap puts things to sleep. Zen lets you levitate. Uh, Yaz makes you invisible. That is probably one of the most powerful spells in the game. I got one fairly early on in the fourth game, and it got me out of so. Very many scrapes. Yaz is incredible as a spell. Sun creates a bright light. Kid creates illusions. Rap lets you talk to people. Yap lets you talk to animals. Zip lets you teleport. Far lets you see... Far, see far? Far seeing. See the future, probably. Uh, or, I don't know, it's a pretty weird one. Sometimes you get visions that just don't come to pass, and sometimes you do. It's, it, it's, it's yeah, it's kind of scrying into a ball kind of thing. It's weird. Res is resurrect. I, I got a, I, you know what? I got a, quite a few holy waters throughout the game, but I never really found many opportunities to use the dang things. And Zed is the most formidable spell in lore, but no one knows why. In all recorded history, the spell has been cast only once by a powerful necromancer from Throben, who is never seen again. Its effects are unknown. The necromancer's notes were found, but were crazed and unclear. Beat with extreme caution. I know what it does because I finished the game, and yep, it's a really, really good spell. But uh, we shall get to that when we get to game four. For now, we have got to venture forth into the Shamatanti Hills. Yep, we got that. Cool. Uh, we should probably go have a look at buying some rations. Hi, uh, two gold pieces per ration is probably the best deal we will ever get. Can we haggle? I want to haggle. Uh, okay, the sergeant is selling flatbreads and cheese. You know who I am? I'm Analan's great new hope, you tell him. The man looks uncomfortable. I know that, but I have to feed my family today, whatever happens to the crown. Okay, fine. I will buy two rations. Uh, maybe more might be necessary, but it's also very easy to lose them, so, yeah. And already my spirit animal has become the whale. I don't know, is, is that because I bought food or because I tried to haggle? I'm not sure what that was. You hand over the coins, the man carefully places two rations carefully into your pack. 
You, you must be sure to eat every day or you will suffer, the sergeant tells you standing at your side. Eating more will give you extra strength, but it is not necessary. So, food in this game, you are encouraged, though not required, to eat at least one meal per day. If you eat one meal per day, sleeping at the end of the day will restore stamina. If you haven't eating, eaten, you actually don't lose stamina. You can sleep and not lose stamina. So if you're on full stamina, you actually just don't need to eat. Um, as, long, as long as you're fit and healthy, there's no actual real requirement to eat. Um, although if you, if you don't sleep at all, if you keep going through the night, that will cost you stamina and you will, you'll feel weaker for it in the morning. Uh, so regardless of how much you've eaten, if you don't sleep, it will cause you problems. So that's how that system works. Uh, if we go to the training ground, do we need a training fight? You walk with the sergeant to the training ground and he wraps the base of his staff in, staff in leather. So ready my sword, I guess we don't have a choice. Three in, the sergeant says, we will practice the stances. First defend yourself against me. Defend. Bring. Okay. I will now defend myself. Whatever attack you play will damage me, but a strong attack will use it more power. You should choose a weak attack. So yeah, this is how we attack. We can go boom, for nine power and charge at him. Uh, but if he's going to defend, that will all, no matter how much power I do, he will always take one damage. So I want to do, and and my attack power will go down. So we kind of got a full attack meter here. If I do a full nine power charge, I will have less of this meter to spend next time. Uh, I will have less of that available to actually work with. So that'll probably cost me in combat. So since a 0.1 power attack, a quick jab, and a charge will do both do one damage in this instance because he's told us it will. We're best off doing that because that really, well, it won't really cost us any energy. So, there you go. One damage. Boop. He's down to three. Good choice. A stronger attack would have wasted more of your power. I will defend myself again, he says. Okay. Jab. Cool. Got it. You play a low attack overpowering the Sight Master again who raises his defense. You played carefully and won that round. Well done. My next attack will be one of my strongest. If you can perform a full attack, you may overpower me. Otherwise, you would best defend yourself. So only one person per round takes damage as well. So if he does, oh, see my, see my my full power is 8.9 now, not 9.0. If he attacks for 9.0, I will take like four damage, uh, or it's probably, maybe two. I don't know. I don't know how much damage they deal at this stage in the game, but I will take a lot more damage. It's kind of it kind of depends on the actual power difference between the players. If the difference is very very close, the damage will be high. Assuming one of the assuming one of them isn't zero, so an eight point nine and a nine, the nine will do crazy damage to the eight point nine, and I would also lose a lot of stamina from that. I'd lose both stamina, as in my health and attack power, because I've used a powerful attack. So I would come out of that very very badly. I shall lunge if he uses nine. Oh, he uses seven point five. That's okay. So there we go. Four damage. You play a strong attack, injuring the sight master once more. He bows. You have finished me. Excellent. Good. You've killed me. Carry on. Just a flesh wound. And yeah, you've got this try again button. You can redo any fight in the game. You seem to remember the basics, the sergeant says breathlessly. Good, another round of training. I got the hang of that. You shake your head. Very good, the sergeant agrees. But if you wish about in earnest, then I warn you, I will not go easy on you. He indicates the wider yard, where there's space for a true match. Ooh, we could fight in the yard. I don't know, don't know if we get anything out of that, so. Poor John. Only thing I stand to lose is my health. You reach the foot of the mighty gate. It is sealed. A sergeant places one hand on the wood. The gate has been locked for some time to deter raiders, he tells you. But you will have no difficulty. The stars in this place allow the DOP spell to be crafted. And he stands back. We shall go and cast a spell! Woo! I've been quite so dramatic before. D. E. O. 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 E. Opens locks and doors. That cost me one stamina to cast. And the tumblers of the door begin to creak and groan. Then the hinges turn with a noise like a hail on canvas roof. roof. These gates have not opened since our last champion was lost, the sergeant says. I wish you more luck than he. Perhaps you'll even meet him in, on your travels. Uh, there's a character in the game that I'm now wondering if that is him. I don't know if it is, and he's never claimed that it is. But a little bit of me kind of wonders if maybe it might be. And I'm just going to turn my phone off like that because it's pinging. Alrighty. If I overtake him, then he is too slow. The Sightmaster nods. Ooh, that changed me to the Raven. I guess your personality is more easily 
forged and malleable at this early stage in the game. Your your choices, your decisions, the things you say and do change your spa spirit animal very, very easily. Uh, towards the latter end of the game, short of actively walking up to an altar and picking a different god, it really doesn't change that much. I guess there's kind of like different meters competing visibly behind the scenes uh, based on your decisions and you pick things, uh, pick a particular personality type consistently, uh, then then I guess, you, you, you know, you're going to have one particular spirit animal. I would like the raven. The raven would be cool as a spirit animal. Like Master Nod's peering at something on the horizon. I believe he's returning, but transformed. I hope you do not meet the same fate. He claps you on the shoulder. He's the sight master. The sight masters have incredible vision. They can see for miles around. Uh, so maybe he is returning. Maybe the sight master could see him. So can I have a look at my raven? Can I have a look at my raven? It's not letting me click on that. How am, I supposed, how am I supposed to get healed? I may have to click the pray button down here. In the mobile version, tapping on Raven or the, this little banner in the top corner always worked. I don't know if it does here. Together you step into the shadow of the wall. Well, one last word, he declares. When you have the crown, find the highest point you can find. We will be watching. Uh, watching from where? From here. Sightmaster warriors are selected from birth for the incredible powers of telescopic vision. You cannot help but wonder how far he can see. I said. Tell me what lies ahead. Oh, Gorilla. Oh, back to Gorilla. Gorilla was the one I wound up with when I played through the game before. I don't want to be with Gorilla. I've been with Gorilla. This path leads first to Cantapani, a settlement of traders, though most are rogues and thieves. You should be there before the sun has reached its peak. From there, three routes lead on to Kristatanti, but no single route is safe. Hakabad is a land of devils. And beyond Kale? I cannot see so far, he says. But once you have crossed the city port of traps, you will enter the backlands. They say the day and night there are controlled by forces other than the sun. And from Kare too, your progress will be watched. It is time to go. You thank him and pass through the gate. The faces of the folk watching your departure reveal the hopes that rest on you and your quest. The early morning air is crisp and the rising sun paints the slopes in shades of peaceful beauty, concealing the evil that lies ahead. <laughs>